This episode is brought to you by the Innovative Leadership Institute, working with companies that recognize the need to upskill their leaders and transform their organizations. We help executive teams prepare for accelerated uncertainty by creating the foresight needed to stay competitive and transforming organizations to become future ready. If you'd like to discuss how we can help prepare your organization for tomorrow, please visit InnovativeLeadership.com and click Contact Us. Hi, welcome to Innovating Leadership, co-creating our future. I'm your host, Maureen Metcalf, founder and CEO of the Innovative Leadership Institute, where we help leaders be future ready. Helping us in this mission today is Pauline Kubel, founder and managing partner of SheEquity. SheEquity's purpose is to provide smart and sustainable investments for African female entrepreneurs and innovators. We'll be discussing the urgency to close the gender funding gap. Pauline, I am thrilled to have you back on the show today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Maureen, for having me back. What is She Equity? And give us a little bit about your path to get here. Your journey was a challenging one. Yeah, and thank you for the question. So basically, She Equity is a gender lens fund. The vision is around causing the gender funding gap in Africa. So just to remind everyone, today we're talking about US dollars, 42 billion gender funding gap in Africa. So I set up She Equity with intention exactly to address this gender funding gap. And to do so, because I understand better, I think, than many people who might be in the U.S. who have never been to Africa, that addressing the gender funding gap in Africa takes more than just writing a check. So therefore, our investment approach is an ecosystem approach. So what I mean by that, we decided to set up an investment firm that started by de-risking female-owned and led businesses. And then being in the position to provide the seed capital, you know, investing from seed to series A's. For those who don't speak investment terms, that's really the very early stage investment. I'm doing this, Maureen, you have said it. uh, It's actually not necessarily about paying back. It's actually paying it forward. Because my journey started off being born in this beautiful country, Rwanda. And my journey led me to the U.S., where I arrived as a refugee. And really got a lot of support from my families that gave me home and recounted my hope to believe in American dream that that dream also belonged to me. To actually also supporting me to navigate the education system in the U.S. because my actual reason to come to the U.S. I wanted to go back to school and you know equip myself with a skill set that can allow me to go back and support other people who might need my support and again leveraging the culture understanding that I bring to the table so people who supported me what I love about that they didn't really just feed me but they really enabled me to do things they could see through me the talent I had, which I, I had lost hope that I had. And when I got in a position to look back, I realized I could do the same. However, the women we, we are focusing on are not women who are asking actually for help. They're just asking for equal access to capital. Again, my journey to refugee camp to the U.S. and then to Europe also it involves in me getting a two Fulbright scholarship, one as a scholar and one as a fellow, which it's hard to get. But also what this Fulbright program did for me to opening up a lot of opportunities, whereby by the time I finished my school, I actually had many choices. Again, I'm thinking about starting from struggling to now you have many choices and you're deciding what do I want to do with my, my life. And I chose to pursue a career that is really purpose-driven. They allow me to support other women. One, because I believe women are the key to, you know, having everlasting change. And the second, when it comes to women, African women have been underestimated for a long time and underfunded. And why this, you might sit back and think this is their problem. Actually, it's a problem for all of us because those women who are being underfunded, underestimated, actually the key to addressing all challenges. And they're doing it despite the fact that they're not getting challenged. So she equity is really there to unlock the financial capital but also all other sort of capital that we believe if you channel towards African women, 
we kind of stop talking about poverty in Africa and start talking about prosperity for everyone. So that's, in essence, why I set up She Equity, because one, again, I think my positioning today, where I consider myself a true global citizen, I could be a good bridge for someone who want to understand the different worlds that I belong to. And I wanted to build that bridge for the benefit of African female entrepreneurs. I love what you're doing. And specifically, the idea of creating an ecosystem and creating a bridge from poverty to prosperity that isn't a handout, that you're helping develop skills and capacity, creating an ecosystem of support. There was something in the headlines this morning about X billions of dollars spent to address homelessness as one of the challenges. And it seems that as a society, we want to invest money to fix problems, but the money absent the ecosystem that ensures people will be successful ends up being an impartial and often unsuccessful solution. You're really incubating not only this solution in a very specific place in Africa, but you're incubating a transferable solution that can expand and not only to women in Africa, but women and people globally. Yeah, exactly, Maureen. Uh, you use the beautiful words that is hard for me to follow. But maybe also to go back in terms of your second part of your question, like what have I achieved since we last spoke. In terms of investing, we have made nine investments, you know, backing solutions designed by women who, who are addressing challenges in healthcare, in mobility, in the climate change, food security, and, and so on. And, and the good news is actually the money we raised to build this whole pilot fund to showcase that, yes, you can find women-owned and led businesses in Africa that are innovative, impactful, and scalable. So this pilot fund has been fully vested, meaning we invested all the money, which is really a testimony that there are more companies looking for funding than funding being available to do so. And also we added this accelerator, the Shea Equity Business Accelerator, where the, the risking part happens. And as we speak, we have now completed the three cohorts. Each cohort uh, is made of 30 women. So we are piloting this in West Africa and, and supported. We, we got funding from the USAID, Trade Hub West Africa, to do so. We went beyond just focusing on the countries that people are familiar with, where most of investors go. So those are mostly Anglophone-speaking countries. So we added Francophone-speaking countries. So as a part of our course right now, two of them are coming from Anglophone countries and one is from Francophone countries. And as we speak, we are in the process of onboarding two new cohorts, one Anglophone and one Francophone. Again, each one is a uh, set women entrepreneurs who already have businesses that are running. And most who have not, never you know, raised money, we are having a program that supports them to become investment ready to understand what do investors expect from me when I show up to present my business and also how do I negotiate for myself? We all know that in general, women, we are generous. So when negotiating, we tend not to be very strict. And sometimes people use this to take advantage of our generosity. So part of the program is really getting women to understand you're building a businesses, you have created this much value. When someone else is coming into your businesses, you have you, this is what you can ask and this is how you ask. And it's okay to walk away because not all money are, are good money as well or all investors are the right fit for you. We achieved this actually because of the community also we built. So we just published our impact report for our pilot fund. And the first two pages is a, includes different names and acknowledgement of what I call she equity family. Because the problem we're trying to address is it can't be solved by sheer pity alone or by self anyone. It's really, it takes a village. So I'm also proud to say that our village has grown. Many people here are reaching out, how can we support and how can we really be a part of it? You know, this uh, beyond the narrative, beyond the discussion about take actions. One of the things that is a concern for me, Maureen, is now people are speaking about gender inequity, gender inequality. So you will assume that they will take actions, but there is also a gender washing that is taking place. So 
it's important that we put our money where our mouth are. And it's a, it's good to say that the She Equity Village, those are people actually who are trying to see from what I hear, maybe I can coach, maybe I can mentor, or maybe I can write a check. So we have built a platform that allows anyone who wants to go beyond talking and take actions to join us. I love the idea of the village. And for some reason, the term village resonates with me that in a village, if I think of my community as a small village, we do step in to help each other. And it's everything. It's helping shovel people snow. It, it's the thing we do when we see someone could benefit from assistance from people with more experience in one area or another. Yeah, that's quite very important for us as well, for people also to understand this, because for quite some time, when people think of African women in business, they think of microfinance or they think of women needing help, like, uh, you know, the NGO type of help. And that has been good in the sense that women who needed microfinance have been managed to access microfinance and women who needed really help have gotten it. But there's this confusion, like every woman in Africa, that's what they need. So we need to showcase with a concrete example how African women who are innovators and entrepreneurs are actually creating market-oriented innovation. They're taking to the market and they can solve the problem from that perspective. And this type of women are the women that we are focusing on. And those women, the only help they need is to navigate the existing gender biases in the ecosystem. So that's why the program we run, but also the us focusing 100% on investing in women owned and led business is important because they don't need to deal with those biases that tend to be associated with usually teams that are not diverse, where investment team doesn't even have women on their team. You tend to see more biases towards investing in other men. That makes perfect sense. I heard very clearly the distinction between microfinance, the work of NGOs, both of which are valuable. You're adding value in a different space in helping people build their capacity to be capitalists and supporting investments that don't fall into the microfinance category. So fast forward five to 10 years from now, what do you want to happen based on the investment of your life's energy right now? 10 years from now, I would want to present to our investor the best return that they have ever had, which will confirm the fact that actually when you invest one dollar in a man and you give the same one dollar to a woman, the woman gives you at least 2.5 X more, multiple more than what men give you. So I would want to show this by example that yes, indeed, women perform better if given equal opportunity to access. And then secondly, I would not want to discuss a gender funding gap anymore because actually people would be rushing to find businesses owned and led by women to invest because they would have understood that this is the best, fast road to get to good return, and, but also to get to the highest impact you can imagine. And by then, we would have achieved the sustainable development goals. And the reports will be showing that this was done because we closed the gender funding gap. For people who don't know what the Sustainable Development Goals are, can you just give a quick, what is that? Those are 17 goals that the different countries have agreed on and within the framework of UN United Nations. So those goals are towards achieving what they call sustainable development. So when you look at challenges faced by everyone globally, including climate change, for example, so climate change is not an issue just because you are poor or you're rich or you live in California, you live in Kigali, vice versa, right? So people understand that you need to take specific actions collectively to address climate change. So some other goals are like goals around, you know, achieving universal health care. So that basically making sure that everyone who needs to see a doctor, whether it's for prevention or whether they are sick and they need uh, to be seen, they can walk in and be treated no matter where they live, right? Because this will also have impact on economy and everything else. And then we have one specifically on the agenda, that's the goal number five, which basically call on a, a member state to address and cause the gender inequity 
and the gender equity is really around funding women uh, own and led businesses. And then inequalities around including women leadership in management, but also the whole, you know, you know, pay gap because, you know, globally women tend to be paid less than men for the same equal work and probably better outcome from women, I would argue. But until we have laws and, and the way to monitor and report, this is not going to happen because probably women will continue to accept what's given to them while men who are in a position hiring tend to will t- continue to hire other men and offer better package. That's a really helpful foundation upon which we're having the conversation is, again, global issue. Doesn't matter which continent our chair happens to be inhabiting. Some have made more progress than others. You said you invested in nine companies. Give us a couple of examples about what you've seen from those companies since your investment. What we have seen from the company that we have invested in is, again, a confirmation of the fact that women, when they decide to set up businesses, they want to address real challenges. And focusing on addressing the real challenges, they also create solutions that would respond to the market needs. And for example, one company we invested in in healthcare uh, that's called the Medzaf that is based in Nigeria started off to address an uh, issue around fake medication in Nigeria. And what triggered the founder Viviane to set up the company is because one of her friends died after taking a fake me- medication. So she wanted to understand why and then she realized while she's doing the research, there was a need actually to prevent this from happening. So she set up Medzaf with the intention to prevent more fake medication being handed out to the patient and then eventually not surviving. And along the line of addressing this challenge and setting up a business that was attracting customers, she also realized that many other issues around the whole value chain. So from shipping to arriving to in the hands of the consumer, but also issues around inventory and financing. So she then eventually ended up setting a platform that is focusing on really providing and accurate medication that is safe, but also affordable. And right now she's servicing more than 270 uh, clinic and hospital in Nigeria. It has impacted more than 30 million people. So those are people who have interacted with the ecosystem that she's serving. And she's now working with the government of Nigeria to make sure that this solution is in the hands of every remote area-based clinic in Nigeria. And she is also at the same time getting ready to see how she takes this solution to other African markets. The other company we invested in in Kenya called Ecodudu is uh, in the business of providing uh, insect protein. So their motto is feeding the, the future, tapping into circular economy. So what they do, they collect waste, like by degradable waste, and then they use African side soldiers, which at the end they become maggots, and then they harvest those maggots, which they grind into feed for uh, other like uh, fish and the likes. So th- this company is addressing two issues. One is also waste management because the waste they're using, it's a waste that could probably be dumped anywhere. But also they training farmers to also do the same and become part of the whole value chain so they can be a part of also producing insect protein and the selling to Ecodudu and making money while doing that. So the second part is they are basically providing insect protein, which is used instead of over food fishing to provide feed for fish. So the company is doing pretty really, really well. Uh, they actually have brought in new investors. And in terms of impact, they, beyond the waste correction itself, they able to contribute towards reducing the CO2 emission into the atmosphere. Maybe if I can mention another one in Nigeria is where it's called Shatla. And this company is you know, addressing issue of transportation for professionals going from work to home and vice versa. I know like many people in the U.S., when they go to work, they have cars those who don't want to drive, maybe they live where you have trains or public transportation. This is not necessarily available everywhere. In Lagos, Nigeria, if you don't have a car, 
the only option is to take mini buses that stop everywhere. So you don't really know what time it's going to take you to get to work. You arrive, stress, so your productivity level is going to be low. So what this woman saw is basically the need to respond to the needs of young professional who are entering the workforce, who want to arrive to work feeling comfortable and ready to be productive. But also by doing so, it might mean that they will not think about buying another car, which will be a contribution also to Again, the whole cause of climate change. So this company is doing extremely well. They just raised recently a new round of $4 million. They're growing their businesses from uh, Lagos to Abuja and looking at going to other countries. Again, when you look at impact perspectives, when you look at financial perspective, those companies just confirm what we knew when we, we set up Shea Equity, that you know you have women who are really working hard or they needed access to capital. One of the things I heard very clearly is in your examples, it seems important to make the distinction, this is not microfinancing. While that is also important, these are organizations and companies that are impacting an entire country and in some cases beyond a country into multiple countries on the continent. It's an opportunity space that wasn't being served and these women-owned businesses are solving problems that are important. Exactly, Maureen. So those women would have seen a problem where they believe if they solve it, the solution they have designed can actually be applicable to multiple markets. We are only backing in a very, very scalable businesses. What we mean by that, the women would back when they see a problem, we have done enough research to see whether there's a similar solution that exists. And if there's a similar solution that exists, they will not set up those businesses because they know also on the marketplace, those other business will disrupt them. So actually, usually they will come into the solution by disrupting the inefficiency in the ecosystem. And uh, with a solution that is strong enough, that it's going to win because one, the person who created it understand it perfectly the market understand the user who, whose uh, solution was designed for, and uh, they have a strategy to deliver this solution. So those are, again, a group of women in, in at least in African context that are struggling because of the gender funding gap linked to biases, but also because mainly there are not many investors who look like me who are Africans who understand where those women are coming from. So if you come in from uh, you know, Ohio, because I know you have a team based in Ohio and you want to go and invest in Lagos, Nigeria, and you have never been, you don't live there, you don't speak the languages, you don't understand the complexity, it's going to be hard for you to design a solution that's going to be working. But if you live there and you have observed the trend and you have spoken to the actual users, so the market testing starts before you even bring the product to the market. One of the things I love is the thing you just said. So we often want to help, you know, good-hearted people want to help. And we see a problem either in our neighborhood or the neighborhood down the street or across the globe. And and we think that because we've fixed it in our community or it doesn't exist in our community, that we can use the solutions that we would do in Columbus, Ohio, in Lagos, Nigeria, or in Ghana or Rwanda, that we've seen so many instances, again, of well-intended people taking a solution that isn't culturally appropriate or systemically designed. And then when the solution doesn't work, we think the people are bad or incompetent or, you know, whatever happens that you have solved for the disconnect between taking a solution that isn't tailored to that environment. And you're allowing people globally to help where they want to in a way that is specifically culturally and systemically appropriate for a community. Because what works in Lagos is not going to work in a rural setting in the same country. Yeah, there is a whole lot of research around the fact that despite a good intention, we set up to do things, but we don't realize the intentions is not good enough. Mm -hmm. The packaging and delivery and, and paying attention who the users are, it's a part of actually solving the problem. And, and I, I believe it's important and it, the time is now to start thinking about true partnership. So there's nothing wrong, Maureen, for someone from anywhere to say, I want to solve a problem in Lagos, Nigeria. So that's good. 
the question is how they go around about so they can team up with someone who's based there and they can bring whatever knowledge they have that's complementary and work together. But if you try to do it alone because you believe you got a good degree, you got a good experience, you have to remember context matters. And in terms of the businesses, you need to understand your market. You need to understand the market risk. You need to understand the trend. And it's, it will be hard for you to understand this if you're not living in the market or you don't have a team living in the market. And you don't understand also the policies around how to do things in those particular settings. For me, I call on people to collaborate because we are investing in multiple markets in Africa. We have a team in different markets. But when we want to invest in a market where we don't have a team members, we find network members to work with to make sure that there's nothing we're missing that one is someone who's actually in the market regularly will understand. I think that's a really important distinction again, because I heard Nigeria and Kenya, and I believe you are also serving other countries. And back to the point that even a country isn't homogenous, just like the US isn't homogenous or Germany isn't homogenous. A solution that works in an urban setting very likely won't work in the same way in a rural setting. When you're thinking about introducing a new product or service, in the market, so you're betting that people will believe that what you create is needed and be ready to pay for it, right? So unlike NGOs, where you, when you give things for free, people tend to take them, whether they use them or throw them away, that's a different story. For a business, someone has to pay. So if you design something that when you introduce it to the market, no one pays, your business doesn't continue, it just ends, right? So that's where also when you're dealing with, you know, startups or innovators, entrepreneurs, it's very important to think about who actually is the driver, who's designing, who's implementing, and who's tipping up with the trend to understand what are the risks that you might have not seen, it, or the risks that are coming that happen just, and you can only know them because you there. By the way, this is the reason why also some invest on the other, other side is they tend to invest in Africa or other markets because they have a perception of risk. So Africa, unfortunately, is one of those places, the continent, where the perception of risk from a non-African people perspective is very high because partially we have a 54 or 55 countries, depending on which number you want to pick, which political narrative you want to go with. We have have many languages we're highlighting marina however within the country you have a lot of diversity in terms of the region the people the language and we also have like anglophone speaker francophone portuguese speakers and so there's all those complexities so if you want to invest somewhere in Tucson, arizona where my other home and you want to invest in africa because that's what people say africa even though it's multiple countries where will you begin if you never been to Africa. So the easy thing to say, okay, I'm not going, it's too much, it's too risky. I don't know anything about it. So what I would like to say to such people is to say, actually, you can reach out to people like us, like Shea Equity, other investor in the market, and we can collaborate and be your launching pad so you get to know the market. Because also I believe like if you are an investor wanting to have an impact and also generate an excellent return, you, you can't ignore African market because this this is a continent where you have the highest number of young people. About 70% of Africa are under the age of 30. This is a continent with more babies being born. The African population collective is like 1.3 billion right now and it's growing. But at the same time, it's almost the same as uh, India and China, but then China and India is one country, Africa is multiple countries, which again, complexity. But see, today, the good news is that Africa is working on a, a possibility to have one market in a way that you invest in your parent union, right? So if you invest in the one country, you can actually be able to scale your, your solution to other markets. So I think it's a time now for any investor who want to be where the growth will happen or is happening to try to understand how do you do business in Africa? 
And the people like me who are the bridge are willing and ready to, you know, serve the purpose. Either invest with us, invest through us, or even partner where we can share what we know. For me, it's also important that people understand the real risk versus the perceived risk when it comes in Africa, because that's one of the reasons why the amount of investment available on African continent is very small comparing to other countries because people are worried about, I don't know, it's too many risks, I'm not going to go. So that's the other side. You have people who want to come in and pretend they can do it. But in investment space, professional investors, it's the opposite. They don't come because they don't know the market, so they stay away. And I think they're missing out. Pauline, you've used the term several times, de-risking the investment. And now you're talking about risk, which big investors, especially institutionals, are heavily indexed on managing risk. What are you doing to de-risk these businesses? What we're doing to de-risk our businesses is uh, starting by identifying a big pool of potential deals running a 17 weeks program where we get to meet the founders, we get to understand the business model, we get to understand the team, we get to understand the market where they operate. And then it's through the program which involves different master classes, class coaching and mentorship. One of the things that we validate immediately is whether the founder is someone you can trust or someone you can execute because that's important. At the end of the day, you invest in people and then the business model. So this first layer being able to say, okay, by the end of the program, we actually know the, the founder. Of course, you can never pretend you know someone 100% or you, you eliminate all the risk. That would be misleading if, if this means like there's zero risk. There's always going to be risk. It's more how do you understand how people are ready to address the risk or even whether they are aware of those risks in the market where they're operating. So the mentorship and the coaching is also helping us support founders who might really know how to run the business, but they need coaching to know how to run teams, how to negotiate future deals, how to price their products and services, how to navigate the whole business world. Because once you put a business out there, you are, whether you want it or not, so you're going to be interacting with everyone. So you run the coaching and leadership program, right? Not many people have you know, a chance to go through this program. But when you see a problem as a startup founder in Africa, especially a woman startup founder in Africa, you don't have luxury most of the time or money to hire someone to be your executive coach or to mentor you. You focus on building a solution and trying to, to, you know, to benchmark the market. But when you're thinking about growing and scaling, you need to understand other the things and that comes with you know again being able to be coached the other part is uh, also how people manage the finances so you know one of the key models in our program is uh, the whole financial management but also being able to see that team has set up a clear kpi for how they manage the finances because initially founders sometimes they don't have an accountant and they might not really keep a record. So if you, you don't have this, you can't convince an investor that you can generate a return because there's no history, right? So our, the risking is really looking at the key aspects that are important when we're making investment decisions. So that's again around finances, around teams, it's around basic leadership and management, but also the ability to understand your competition in the market. So because of we are, we're running two cohort a year where we have 60 women and we're raising a small fund right now, minimum 25 million US dollars. So we have a bigger pool than actually a number we can invest from. So every year we, we choose top five from each cohort that we send to our investment team for assessment. So there's no guarantee that when you go through Shiba that you will get an investment from She Equity, but you get a fast track to the investment team and then you go through the proper due diligence. So on the top of this, we also work with existing accelerators and incubators across the markets. And I, you know, my previous job included working with this group of ecosystem enablers. So they also send it to us businesses that are ready to raise. And those businesses will have gone through a more similar program where someone can, you know, say, I know Pauline, she has delivered, she has been consistent, she does what she says she's going to do. All of those things that I can usually check in the reference, right? 
So when then you're doing your own due diligence, you're focusing on other things, digging deeper, but it's not the first time you're meeting the founder. I love that in addition to looking at the products and the placement and the competitive analysis that you are looking at the leadership, while one is not more important than the other, it is certainly important. And back to these, you know, foundational characteristics, how do we deal with adversity and challenge and terms like grit that when things are tough, we have a way to figure out how to go forward because it's generally not there for us. We have to keep moving when we really want to go crawl under the covers or something. Or pivoting. That's another term is used, pivoting. So you start to solve this problem and you you design this solution. The execution, putting your product to the market, the feedback you're getting from the market is showing you that maybe you need to change your packaging, maybe you need to tweak the product, maybe you need to change the whole approach. From a business perspective, it's okay to go back and reevaluate whether you move forward or you change this, you know, the, the direction. Because if you don't, you're not going to make it. So that's also a skill set that only comes with the leadership and also that skill set ability to to smell what's next, what makes sense. It's intuitive, I guess, that you can't measure in general, but you can observe, you can watch and see who's able to do it over time. I'm just trying to think of what measurement tools we have that would help with that. But to your point, part of it is observation and track record. Yeah. And the track record is tricky because uh, tra- I mean, us as investment ma- fund manager, we ask to have a track record. And sometimes you, you don't really know what a track record means. Is it how many investments you have made? Is how long you have been investing? But also to do that, you need to get investors to put money into your business to bid it track record. So that's why for us through Shiba and then really the reason we added Shiba as a part of our investment strategy is it to be able to look at those other soft skills that would, you know, give indication that this person, if given all the tools, they can deliver because they understand ABC better than anyone else who's trying to solve the same problem. Because again, from a business perspective, competition is a key. So when you're coming in as a new in a market with new service or product, you need to convince me if I'm an investor or any other investor that your product and service is better than what's out there. And also that you're prepared to keep enhancing it. So if someone has come up with something similar, you're still going to be ahead. You're going to have first move advantage. And the first move advantage, you can only have it most of the time if you can execute. And execution most of the time requires also that you need financial means to do so. And this is the reason why in African context, so there's a, people talk about the fact that 40% of a small and medium enterprise are owned and led by women. But at the same time, investors say they can't find the deals to invest in. So what we're learning is through Shiba, because there's a lot of learning we're realizing that coming through Shiba, is the majority of them, they're not investment ready. Mm. And they're not investment ready because they haven't been able to access it, the kind of skill set that you need when you live in a perfect ecosystem where you, you get support. But also where you know, if you're coming from a school, you get enough money to kind of pilot. Many founders in Africa don't have this luxury. They start by bootstrapping with what they have. And then over time, if they don't even, you know, get funding, they survive, but they stay there. And they get used to running what they do, you know, making some money, but not enough to attract someone who wants to make 2x, 3x return. For us, Shiba is also that pipeline that can move this number, this statistic, to start thinking about the growth. And this is also tied to mindset. If you've been operating on both strapping for so long and you realize this is the only thing you have, you need to work on your mindset to realize I need to change the language because I'm going to be interacting with people asking me questions that beg a response where I can show I'm going to be ahead of the game when it comes to market trends. You've talked about She Equity. You've partnered She Equity with Sheba, but we haven't talked much about what Sheba is. I assume that's the incubator and the training program with cohorts. And I think you said 17 weeks. Tell us a little more. And one of the things I'm curious about, we've used the term women owned businesses as if it's a black and white term, not a percentage. So I assume some of these businesses could be husband, wife, brother and sister, neighbors. What is considered a woman owned business? 
So, so maybe let me start with that one and then I come back to Shiba. So for us, we use 35% ownership. We only invest in a company where we see on a cap table. So the, the shareholder recording show that women in leadership and management team own at least 35% in a business. Why 35%? For us, we understand that also it's important to have a diverse teams, to have other people on team, because whatever you're doing, it's always good to have different voices. The same reason we advocate for including women. I think it's important that also we don't exclude men because they have different view. And so if you have a team that is diverse, and depending on how many people are in leadership, we believe like 35% is, is good enough, especially when we're coming in very early, for those women to stay in the business for a while and shape the direction of the business, but also be the worst for themselves, which then trickles down to everyone. Because for us, the equity, you know, building worse is a part of the reason why we exist. And what also is known is that you cannot fire someone who owns something. So if you own 35% in the business and they are more a shareholder than the company, you're probably going to be among the people who own a good size of, of, of share in a company that gives you voting right. So even if you don't get along and you leave, you're still going to show up in shareholder meetings. So you have ability to shape the business. And, and we believe that's the only way we can change the whole narrative to when women start actually building businesses where they own something in them. Otherwise, you're working for someone, they can fire you. You are on the board. The board has a term. The term ends. You're no longer there. So the, the ability to shape and influence is stronger. Uh, and eventually, the trickle-down economics in terms of the impact on the family and the community is clear when women actually own the business they're building. And now, in terms of Shiba, this is a program that we added to Shi Equity Investment Strategy because one of the questions we keep getting is like, are you sure you're going to find enough women? Because we are one of the few gender lens investors that look at the ownership in the business because there's a different framework called the 2X Challenge that defines how you can call yourself a gender lens. And ownership is one of them, but it's not the only one. I Shi Equity, we believe, it's the key to addressing gender for the reason I just explained. So when people keep saying like that, you know, if you only looking at this percentage too much, which I think it's not too much, by the way, if you only focusing uh, on a woman on and red businesses, how you are you going to be sure you, you have enough deals? So I team up with uh, a business partner in Ghana. Her name is Anna Tenemba Samake, and she is originally from Mali and she lives in Ghana, uh, has been running at Sereta for quite some time. So we team up so she can lead Shiba because that's what she knows she has done and she has a good expertise in this. So we can actually build that pipeline by de-risking many deals before we look at them for investment consideration. So we started off in 2021 uh, with the first cohort and initially we were doing 16 weeks. And after the cohort, we got a feedback from the participant where they were asking some of other programs they thought we could include. So now we have increased 17 weeks. And it includes master classes, again, looking at HR, finance, governance, and investment readiness itself. Like when you show up to pitch, what should you have even before you knock on the door? You want to talk with investor. And at the end, there's a pitching session. And then we select the top five that we send through the fast track to the investment team for further due diligence and investment consideration. And again, as I mentioned, it's no automatic that when you go through Shiba, you will get investment because that would mean we could find ourselves in a situation where we're promising before we have done due diligence. And we want to make sure that our investors understand Shiba gives us a good trusted pool, but we follow the same investment criteria for everyone. And then at the end, everyone gets a certificate. And one thing I think it's really cool is also the network that we're building when people come through Shiba. So we have created a network that everyone who goes through Shiba becomes a part of the Shiba network. They all call themselves for the, the Shiba, you know, queens and they support each other. Uh, so actually we had a, we had a situation where uh, one of the Shiba queens had a challenge and paused it into the group setting saying, I'm struggling with this, I need help. In less than an hour, they collectively created, uh, you know, solutions to support this woman. 
I look at it, I almost like cry. I'm like, we didn't even think we can get this level. And so that's what happened when you catalyze solutions, because that's what we're doing. We're really catalyzing this platform, but the rest does not depend on us 100%. Of course, some of the participants gain more than others because you gain what you put in. Uh, some are very active, some are very passive. And uh, we're now working towards having a gathering with all cohorts because they have asked for it. So they can actually meet face to face because we've been running this virtually since COVID. You know, a few of them are you know already collaborating when they thought they were competitors. Mm. Because at the end of the day, you're competing in marketplace, not just against each other. You know, so if you can actually find a strategic way to either join forces or introduce your product in each other's market in a way that each one again value. It's a, you gain money from paying a marketing person. So in essence, for us, Shiba is turning out to be the ecosystem builder that would move more women towards the pipeline where they were access to investors. And by the way, when the Shiba concludes, also we introduce them to other end, like angel investors and other investors who are interested in investing in women. So we're planning to host the first uh, demo day where we invite other investors to meet the women who have participated. Because again, it, the intention is also to take away the excuse from investors who say that they don't invest in women because they can't find them. So we want to be showcasing uh, this pool of women saying, hey, yeah, they are. Ask, you know, talk to them. I love the ecosystem approach. I love the combination of the incubator and the training as a pipeline to investing. And then the alumni group supporting both those who get the investment and those who either didn't make it on the first round or haven't yet gotten there, that it really is creating a self-reinforcing system to address your goal of gender gap overall on the continent of Africa, which is no small goal to accomplish. What would you love for our listeners to do or think about as they're listening to you? Because this is certainly a goal that even if you had all the money in the world, you also need people. Yeah. Thank you for that question, Maureen. So the first thing I would say, if what I said raised more questions in your mind, Reach out to me so I can answer those questions. I'd love to speak to anyone who wants to get to understand better the opportunities in Africa beyond investing, because I think you need to understand the place before you even think about doing something. For those who have disposable cash or who are professional investors and they want to go beyond putting their money into bank accounts, but want to generate good, you know, excellent return with the, the highest impact, I would love to speak to them and share more about how SharePT can support do this. But uh, also if SharePT is not the right channel, I am a member of different other gender lens investors, group, mm. different other women-led and own business that I can introduce them to. For uh, institutions that don't necessarily invest but are, are interested in also building the ecosystem, I would love to talk to them as well. Again, from a Shiba perspective, but also again, there are many other people like me who are trying to do this because the problem is big. So I will not pretend it's only Shiba for trying to address this. And yeah, you know, let's talk. And, and also keeping in mind that Africa is the right place to be if you want to be in the business the next 10, 20 years, because that's where we have the highest growing population, a productive youth. Every challenge you hear about in Africa, it's a, an opportunity for a business. And that's what exactly young people are doing. It's interesting. It's really inspiring to see like when you talk to a younger person in Africa, they always looking around like, what's the problem? How can I solve it? And so they, they know just waiting. And when you see what they're doing with pretty much nothing, it makes you realize how much they can do so much if they had actually the investment they need. And that's what we're trying to do at share pretty level. So I invite everyone who would like to learn more to reach out to me and so that I can share more. Just on a personal note, we now have a virtual team member in Kenya. And so to amplify, even as a very small company, we see 
huge opportunity in Africa in helping by creating work opportunities. To your points, for some people, we can send investment money, but for others, it's also creating opportunities for folks who wouldn't yet have those opportunities, and that changes the entire economic equation. Yeah, for example, with with Shiba, we, as I mentioned, we also find mentors and, and coaches for them. And we don't have funding to pay coaches or mentors. We only have a limited resource to do that. For also anyone who wants to get to know African market by coaching a female entrepreneur or mentoring. So Shiba is, is a cool platform. So let's talk as well. So it's, it's really around the intention and we can look at what's possible. Thank you, Pauline. I've traveled only twice to Africa, so I've been to four countries. My first trip was almost 20 years ago. It was shortly after I started the company. And it was really one of the most significant trips, if not the most significant trip of my life. Wow. And one of the things I saw was resilience. So we stayed in a hotel in Tanzania, and it happened to be during an airline strike. So I was, I think, maybe the only patron in the entire hotel. And so I got to meet the chef and the housekeepers and just little stuff. Like I was saying, well, why don't you get this book? And the gentleman said, a book is $25. That's how much I make a month. The complaints I hear from people who have so much And then I'm around people who have comparatively very little and the resilience and the resourcefulness and just the generosity of spirit was phenomenal. That's amazing to hear. And there also the ingenuity that comes with that, you know, because you, as the saying, you know, you want to create the future, you have to create it. You know, I think Africans, especially the younger people today, they got it. And they're doing everything. And again, the market, the needs are there. And uh, it's imperative that we we invest in them, not as a charity, but as a smart business, because we'll be able to showcase only if we start doing it. And for me, Maureen, that's why I do what I do. I wanted to also be in a position to you show instead of telling, because I think telling has its limitation. It was so common, the ingenuity. I and mean, just, I have story after story. How do I find the airstrip? There aren't signs, there aren't street posts. So we would drive up to someone's house, ask them where the, the airstrip is, something we would think of as you get on a road. You're not really, you're driving through people's farms and is the plane on time? There's no board because there's no building. We were asking local people, when did the last plane come? And I was traveling alone part of this. So my guide stayed with me on this, you know, vacant strip of land until a plane came because I couldn't get on my cell phone and call somebody. <laughs> the plane was late. It was just such a different way of being in the world. And so the community support and the kindness was just absolutely changing of my entire point of view. Yeah. So actually, it's nice. It's a bit better when you learn it from a typical news channel, then it's all bad news, right? Mm. As as the National Geographic shows the beauty (laughs) of the (laughs) garden, man. (laughs) But the news just paints a very negative picture. And that's why I appreciate, Maureen, your platform, because we need a more platform where we can showcase what Africans are making for Africa in the world and also the new Africa that people would seem not to notice because they again the news channel have done a good job by painting the gloom picture so when there's a unfortunately a war in Khartoum you know some people think it's the whole continent so because that's what's on the news in Vandover so I am hoping to work with you and, and your network to also bring the voices of those women that we are investing in so people get to meet them. We need them more. <laughs> we need people to meet them more. <laughs> Thank you. So over the next year, let's talk about what we do next. And for now, thank you, Pauline. How would people reach you? Because you've given several calls to action for people to reach out. The easiest way would be through our website, SheEquity. So it's www.sheEquity.com. 
So www.shequity.com and they can reach you through the website. And also, I assume you're on LinkedIn. Yeah. So through the website, they actually can see my LinkedIn channel and also Twitter and they can directly reach out to me. My email address, p.kober, so that's p like Paul dot k o e l b like boy l at sheequity.com. Pauline, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and piloting a solution to what is such a significant global problem. The news shows us the sensational and often bad stories. And so I love that you're sharing a hypothesis and now demonstrated proof that this is absolutely working and scaling. And when we next speak, I look forward to maybe hearing also from one of your companies along with from you. Sounds fantastic. (laughs) 